uh, an education grant. Western SARE provided the funding to Montana State University. And uh, Devin Reagan is the lead principal investigator in that project that's been going on for almost three years now. And she has a graduate student, Tristan Benson, who worked hand in hand with their research. And that research was presented a few weeks ago in the webinar. I uh, hope you all had a chance to, to look at it. If you didn't, the link to that webinar is in the chat box. And uh, if that doesn't work for you, you can just go on NCAT's ATRA website. All you have to do is Google A-T-T-R-A and uh, click on the videos section in the, vi in the website there and that video will, will come up. You'll have to scroll around to find it, but it's called Inter Integrating Livestock with, with Crops, Let Livestock Do the Work. And so um, that webinar is uh, uh, recorded and is free as are all ATRA downloads. Um, the second part of this project of, of Devon's was was outreach done by NCAT and the, the other part that we're doing besides the webinar is two Zoom sessions, one tonight on integrating livestock with, with uh, vegetable crops featuring uh, Leon Stengel from the Hamilton Bitterroot area. And Leon uh, probably knows that I have mispronounced, misspelled, his name every which way <laughs> that is possible and he's still willing to come on. So we really thank Leon to, for participating tonight and leading the discussion on his farm. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. We're going to ask you if you have any questions or want to say anything to um, raise your hand in the lower uh, part of that, uh, of the screen there. See, is that where it goes? Or is it the upper part, Marianne? Um, let's see. It was right by your name, I think. Right by, okay, right by, that's right. Right by your name. Um, that's where you can raise the hand. Uh, and and Marianne will, will call on you and ask, and she'll unmute you. And then you can ask her your question verbally. If you'd rather not do it that way, you can ask your question in the chat box and I'll be running the chat box. And um, when we have a chance to uh, have your question, I will read your question out and we'll get it out that way. So there's two ways to ask questions and to um, discuss what we're talking about today. So I think that is all we have for housekeeping. We're gonna start the, the session with a uh, short a video clip that Leon made in his video. Um, and I hope you've had a chance to, to watch Leon's video. Uh, it's a really great video on how he incorporates three species of livestock on his vegetable, vegetable farm. Um, we're gonna take a little snippet from that video and just to start the discussion. So please, Marianne. Okay, so the last time that we filmed, this was not even a pen yet. It was quack grass that was about panel height. These pigs have been in here for one month and they have pretty much taken all of it out. Of course, brought some more rocks to the surface, but they haven't eliminated the quack grass. They've just reduced its strength. So you can see some areas over there. They're not quite as consistent where they take their, eliminate their feces as like a llama is, but they do have preferred areas. So those areas, the weeds are gonna be a little thicker. When I do come back in and work it with a quacker, I can focus on that a little bit more, space it out, maybe let the roots freeze or dry out, hit it again, and then I'll treat the field or the patch all the same way. So that's what pigs can do in a month. Okay, great, Leon. I really thought that part of the of Leon's video was really neat because at least in Montana here, that is a common problem, common weed we all have on specialty crops is, is quack grass. And so that's how Leon gets rid of his quack grass or controls it. And so 
Does anybody have any questions on that subject or any subject on, on Leon's farm that you'd like to start things rolling with? And if nothing's coming through on the chat box. Um, Nothing yet, Leon, yeah. I don't have a problem with saying, you know, the pigs will vary in their areas as far as where they're going to dig and where they're not, because they don't like digging in the rocks any more than they like digging in a lonely soil. But you can adjust where they're going to dig by moving a water source to it or moving a feed source to it. Or even if it's a larger paddock or pen, you can divide it, cross divide it with an electric fence and force them into one area to work that first. So you can kind of manage them around based on their behaviors. Right, and, and Leon, was it five pigs you had in that There was area? five pigs, and then oh. two were butchered. It went to three, but they were, all three of them, all five of them were in there for about a total of a month. And then I moved them to another area. And how big was that area, Leon? How big? How, yeah. That one was probably, 60 by 70. Hmm. So, so not a huge area. It's really kind of an intensive plowing thing for the pigs to actually get in and do it. Because what I've found with putting pigs in too large of an area is just like cattle or sheep, they keep going back to the areas they've worked. And so when sprouts come up, they'll start nipping off those sprouts or where they've dug, it's easier for them to dig. So you kind of want to force them into new areas or encourage them. Right. Right. Leon, I'm really unfamiliar with pigs and grazing. Do you, I guess if you're putting them into an area, uh, does the moisture content of the soil have any of, I mean, do they prefer if it's a little softer? Is that easier for them to dig or? Oh, it's much easier for them to dig if it's a little bit softer, but that's a way that you can take like a garden hose or even a a bucket or a barrel or a bobcat bucket and dump water over and they'll start mucking around in it. As okay. they start mucking around in it, then that'll encourage them to like spread it out. Okay, cool. So if you think of like an area where you maybe have good microbes in your soil and you can keep feeding the edges of it, they just increase out. Okay. So start in the worst spot or where it's driest or rocky or where you have thistles. They don't really like thistles, but they will definitely eat the roots and dig them up. They just have to be encouraged to want to be there. So you okay. can encourage them with food or water. Usually water is better to get them to root. Yeah, that's what I was thinking that if the ground was softer, they might just find that it is more it appetizing to them to start just digging. Into hard pockets of ground. And so they're not a huge fan of rocks, but as you may see in one of the later videos, they will bring them up to the surface. Okay, very cool. Well, until you have to pick them up. Well, I at guess least they, you don't have to dig them out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I guess the follow-up question is, Leon, is especially if you're having to add water to get them to dig, how about compaction? Have you noticed much problems with compaction? If I water in the same area, or if I have a shady area, that they really prefer to go to, or if the ground's softer, I don't want to add as much water there. I want to take a hose or a nozzle or a sprinkler. Since pigs can't sweat, they really need the coolness of moisture added to their environment in order to just get that cooling of the skin. So if I can take the pigs and leave the one area that they like for shade or where it may be moist, as like a refuse for the afternoon or a refuge for the afternoon and encourage them out with feed or even a small, just a one wire electric fence. If you have a perimeter fence, will allow you to like guide their behavior into a different area. Uh-huh, yeah, great, great. Um, has anybody else on the call had it? Um, uh, experience with using pigs like Leon that they'd like to share that experience.
we do have a question um, in the chat box from Judith. She, she asked, so you use the pigs for both working the ground and noxious weed management, right? How often do you move them to different areas? It kind of depends on what my goals are for that field. And so 12 years ago, I had a farm that we were renting where we had a huge wild rose patch in the center of it. And the irrigation ditch was right on one edge of it. But some of the best soil is where the roses were grown, growing. So we put a fence around it, moved the irrigation ditch over because it was a surface ditch, just a little bit, like 10 or 15 feet. So we didn't pollute the water. And we put the pigs in there for probably six weeks. And I think at that time there were probably 15 to 20 pigs in maybe a hundred by 60 foot area. And within a month, there was hardly a wild rose bush to be found. There were still some on the edges, so we didn't eliminate that species from the environment, but we did recuperate that ground so we could grow into it next year. So it kind of varies on what you need to take out as far as what's there. Or if I do have like a rocky field, I will let them in a little bit longer because if I can manage their water and their rooting, even through feeding, or even putting a light amount of bedding out in the summertime, you wouldn't think pigs would want bedding in the summertime, but having a little bit of straw or some alfalfa for them to chew on really encourages them to work that area up and see what it's underneath. So it works really well with quack grass too, because they love digging up quack grass. It's like pig pasta. And I've heard stories to where quack grass has almost 20% protein in the roots. So it's a viable feed for them. It's just that it's not fed to them, hopefully, in such huge mass that it's their full diet. Yeah. Could you speak a little bit to that, Leon? When you're grazing your pigs, uh, how much how much actual pig feed, you know, are you, you know, um, supplying also? Well, basically I try and keep my pig feed almost regular, just as a routine. And so depending on whether I'm feeding a mixed lentil, barley, wheat, grain screening diet, or if I have to, this year has been tougher with supply chains of getting my stuff in. So I've had to resort to a little bit of corn occasionally. I really like the mixed grains for the diversity of what it's going to bring into the pig's digestive system. I try and keep it pretty much uniform, but I also monitor how much they're wasting. So if they're not cleaning up the amount of feed that I'm giving them, uh, I'll be completely honest. There's days when I'm going to be a little bit lazy and not want to throw the buckets in to feed them and regulate it. So I may take what I think is 15 gallons of pig food in the bottom of the skid steer and dump it over the fence. So when that's the case, the next morning, if that's more than they were gonna eat, I may dump some water there so they can root through, moisten it up, and then feed them in a different spot the next day. So I don't really use troughs as much as I ground feed. And by ground feeding, I know there's a certain amount of waste of the feed that I put in, but I'm also trying to feed my earthworms, my mycorrhizal fungi, and so there's all just sugars that help feed the soil. So those areas along the edge of the fence where I've had the pigs before are frequently richer when I plant a crop in it the following year. Okay, great. We had another question um, along, along that line. Um, uh, Silas asks, should you feed supplement to sheep when they are grazing down broccoli? Yes, yes. I mean. It doesn't have to be necessarily as much. I still try and keep their food somewhat relevant. I don't want to really change the microbes in their digestive system or in their gut so much because it's going to take a while for the, that bacteria to adjust to what they're eating. So if I can keep a base, uh, be it a grass or alfalfa base or just extra graze, they'll come in, they'll take what they want. They will gorge themselves the first couple of days. And their, their bowels will change a little bit as far as the texture, but they find that balance pretty quickly. Uh, Leon, I have a question. Uh, when, you, 
when you butcher these hogs, are you selling them uh, direct to customers? Are you eating them yourselves? Or I am, I'm doing both. I'm selling them direct to customers. So since I've been doing the livestock for over 20 years, I have a list of people that have bought meat from me in the past. And I frequently get a call from them like once a year saying, I'm interested in a quarter of beef or a lamb or a half a hog. And so when I make arrangements with the butcher, I just take them in a list and go down the list, give them a call, let them know that their animal will be slaughtered on such a day. And if they want to call the butcher to give the cutting instructions or how they want it processed directly to them, they can get it customized to their needs. So with that long-term relationship with a lot of my meat customers, I get many of them calling me back and I still have the list. And so if I run an extra one up that I'm butchering four hogs and I only have room for three, I can call down on that list a little bit and see if somebody wants it a little bit earlier. I have to let a cat out of my house just so we don't all have to hear it. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Devin, I think you told me in your sheep projects at MSU that uh, wasn't the sheep you had them grazing arugula and they all smelled like arugula? Is that is that correct? Oh, that I Tristan talked a little bit about the arugula kale experiment we did when years ago we did some grazing at the town's harvest gardens there and there was cilantro out there yeah. and after the sheep grazed that cilantro oh boy it just the air just smelled delicious and the only thing I can think of is doing some experimental trials with feeding lambs certain uh, very flavorful vegetables or herbs and seeing if that affects the meat and there has been a little bit of research on that but boy I love cilantro so I would love to have cilantro flavored <laughs> lime if that were a lamb if that was a possibility yeah Leon, did you have any problems with an off flavor in your um, your pork uh, that you butchered? You know, I don't find that many off flavors just because I try and keep the feed supplemented too. Uh -huh. But pigs have much similar digestive system to humans. And so with that shorter intestine, non-rumen, they're going to take on the flavor of that a little bit more. Uh -huh. My taste buds aren't that sensitive, but I will admit to like grinding extra garlic that I have into the feed in the winter time, just as a medicinal supplement, just as something to help keep them a little healthy. And when we used to grow medicinal herbs, I would have a lot of echinacea stalks. And so I could throw echinacea stalks or astragalus or some of the other herbs into the feed just as like a supplement, a different trace mineral that they're getting in their diet. So I haven't had that much off flavoring of the pork. I did, you know, growing up, I was always advised not to feed oats to pork that was going to be butchered because it would take on an oat flavor. I can't say personally that I've witnessed that. Right, right. Uh, does, um, does anybody else have any questions, especially on this quack grass subject? Uh, do you have problems with quack grass? Um, and what have you done to try to eliminate it? And can you see pigs as being a solution in your operation? We'd like to hear from you. You can raise your hands or just type it in the, talk, in the chat box. And if a question gets sparred or spurred later on, I don't mind revisiting a couple of questions if you don't think of them right away. So it's better to be patient than be a patient. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, we'll go on to the next topic and it's kind of an interesting one also. Um, in the video, Leon showed how, how he sheet composted during the winter with his cattle and in this particular case, he was following it, I believe, with broccoli. Is that right, Leon? Mostly brassicas, some peas. Brassicas. Yeah, right. So, Mariana, if you could dish up that little uh, clip that we have of Leon's video showing um, that sheet composting, that'd be wonderful. Thank you. 
this is where I had overwintered the cattle. So I took a round bale feeder and starting out at the far corner to your right, I put a round bale in there. About every three or four days, the cattle would go through that round bale and I left it just as it is. You know, I didn't till it. I didn't, I drug it once in the spring after I'd pulled them all out of here. So I moved this round bale feeder every three to four days and basically sheet composted this whole area where the brassicas are. I had the cattle out of here by the 1st of January. So I'm easily within six months, not just four of the FSMA look, rules, but allowing that sheet composting to happen, none of the soil was tilled. I did just like I did with the carrots and the beets where I put two tines on the cultivating tractor, just made two narrow trenches and we put our transplants of brassicas into those trenches. We came through with the hoe once to kill the weeds that were growing between the brassicas in the worked up ground. But as we walk through, you can see a few weeds sprouting in the aisles, but the aisles have never been touched except to be driven over. That's just the residual layer of manure that's been packed down, aged, washed, frozen, thawed. Leon, uh, to start this off, I thought this was really interesting part of your video. And maybe to start it off, can you give us a little bit of your goals, what your philosophy is on the ecology of your of your vegetable gardens and, and the market garden there? Because that, that really kind of sets the stage. Well, one of my goals is I've noticed that when I would overtill my soil, I lost a lot of surface moisture. My organic matter depleted much quicker. And so if I didn't have to make more compost and add it to the soil, it looks beautiful when a soil is like rototilled and tilled and you've got this nice fluffy soil to work with. But as you irrigate it or as it rains, it just packs down. So I'm also a vermiculturist just by nature. I really like to promote my warm life, but also with the minimum tillage, I'm creating more of an ecosystem in that top half inch, inch of soil so that I have more beneficial insects, be that beetles to prey on slugs, be that other beneficial parasitic wasps. So the less I till, the more I can keep my organic matter in, not disturb the top two to three inches of soil, over most of my area. I'm still disturbing it in those trenches where I dig, but I'm still keeping at least 80% of my soil undisturbed. So I can build that soil structure for holding carbon and keeping more of my nutrients in the soil for the following year. So the less I have to add, or the less I till it, the less I seem to have to add. And it also holds my moisture a lot better. So let me be uh, really ask a dumb question here. Uh, since I've always gardened with a rototiller, um, would you ever go back to rototilling? <laughs> no, sell it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. You know, if I'm going to use something to tear up the soil, because there's just places where the pigs aren't going to do, I'll use a spring tooth, a quacker, a lighter version of a chisel plow and try and keep it in the upper six to eight inches. So I'm not doing any deep telling, pulling up more rocks and disturbing more of that underneath soil. If I feel that I need to put tra bring trace minerals up in that lower level of subsoil, I can plant radishes or turnips or something with a tap root to bring them up and use that as a cover crop and bring some of my trace minerals up from the subsoil. Right. Can we put this into context, Leon? How long have you been doing this way of farming? And I'm really interested uh, uh, if you did till more at one time. Oh, by far. If, yeah. Have you noticed a difference in the soil aggregation of your, of your farm uh, since you've min tilled, you might say, and incorporated livestock? So what I would say is, on this particular farm that I'm at now, we've only been farming this soil for 11 years. So I don't feel that I have an adequate sample survey. 
so to speak, of where it's at. But I think one way of looking at it is if somebody's been on their farm for long enough and they go dig up some soil right on a fence line, just right up or a, right up along a fence, they'll find how the soil has like clumped and clustered and aggregated. That's a tremendous soil structure. And then if you go out into your field and you've like really over tilled it, over moldboard plowed it, and just work the soil overly and overly, it's much finer. It's almost a silty sand year long, but it, it packs down. You just don't get the oxygen into the roots, into the microbes to help them feed the roots of the plant. So it's still a continuing process. And I don't know if I'll farm long enough to ever be able to prove one way or the other, but it's definitely reducing my workload mm -hmm. by tilling less. And so the more I can use mulches and build the soil, I'm moving my irrigation less, I'm weeding less, and I'm doing fewer passes over the field. And so my vegetable crops don't seem to be affected by tilling less. Immediately, maybe my planting is, or maybe some of the ability to pull the weeds out are, if I'm hand pulling and I have a tap-rooted weed. I mean, I still have problems with dock. Yellow dock is just, it's a big, hardy rooted plant, but by the same token, it has a really soury, almost lemon spinach flavor. So I don't have a problem with putting yellow dock into some of my CSA boxes. So if I can harvest it as a crop and put it as a salad green in, then I'm using that deep nutrient retrieval as well as getting some benefit out as a vegetable. Great, great. Okay, we have some questions. I'm just gonna start as they come in. <clears throat> We're gonna go back to pigs again. And Paul asks, what is the smallest area that you can put a pig in? Depending on the size of the pig. I mean, there's in one of the videos or one of the earlier webinar videos, I had basically an eight by eight foot pen that had four pigs in it and I would move it once a day. Now with that frequent of moving and that size of pig, they're not digging deep into the soil, but they're definitely eating the surface off, doing a little bit of rooting around the edges. So I would recommend that for like, if you were going through your garden and had an old lettuce crop, that if you took one of the pig tractors and moved it each day, just before you moved it, throw some cover crop seed out. They'll eat the surface over. They'll incorporate that cover crop, be it oats, clover, or whatever, right into that zone where they're working. And then you can move it the next day and keep doing that. And you don't have to come back and tilt the soil again because the pigs mm. will work it into just with their hooves and their snouts, work, work it and incorporate it in. Right. So I would say one pig for an area, maybe a week you would still want to put them into smaller areas and move the area to force their grazing into an area. Otherwise they're going to go back to the easiest place to work. So would an eight by eight pen uh, just made with four panels, eight foot panels, would that, would that be small enough for a one pig, like a 150 pound pig? It would be. The problem you get, unless you really use something heavy for the panels, is once they get up to a hundred pounds or more, they're going to start moving the pen themselves. Okay. So smaller pigs work better in the smaller pig tractors, as I call them. And then once they get a little bit larger, you're almost better off with a larger pen and fencing it off with electric fence. Okay. So use their own deterrent against them. So in a pig tractor is like, what's the ideal weight of pig? That's good for a big tractor. I would say anywhere from like weaning age up to 75 pounds. Okay. And Great. then when they get much larger than that, they're going to start nudging it and moving it. And so unless you want to stake it down on one side, or I haven't tried it yet, but you could probably put them on like a guy wire, like people do with their dogs and putting them on clotheslines on a leash. It's like, just let them go back and forth. But I haven't tried that, so I can't speak to it. Huh. Okay, we've got another question here. Maybe we should have uh, 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 shared it at the beginning, but, um, and, and for a more detailed uh, answer to this question, I urge you to go back to Leon's uh, video that he made that 
you can find on the ATRA website. But the question is from Laura, and she says, can Leon share a brief overview of his vegetable farm operation? How many acres in production, main products marketed, and what type of product of markets? That's a good question. So most of my specialty crops are done through a CSA program that we started. We limit it to about 25 boxes for an 18 week period. So each week we'll make 18 boxes split up over two or 25 boxes split up on two days. We grow anything from rhubarb and asparagus, lots of greens. We don't have a problem with putting in some pigweed or some, we call it wild amaranth or some lamb's quarter into one of the salad mixes. As long as we let people know what they're eating and what they're dealing with, we frequently put, we have a blog and a website. We'll put recipes each week of what's in their box and different ways that they can possibly use them. So we grow anywhere from 20 to 50 different crops. And so it'll go from asparagus and rhubarb and greens early in the spring through peas, through beans, tomatoes, peppers, corn, all the way into winter squash. And we will wildcraft a few apples and plums from some neighboring farms to finish out the box just for the fall. What we do beyond that is we sell at one of the local farmers markets just with the surplus that doesn't go into our boxes. So we're able to get rid of the direct the overflow. If we have a great crop or, and I try not to make this happen as much as I used to, I plant too much of something sometimes. So through our website, we can put on what we call a veggie feast and allow people to make an order of a whole box of cauliflower or a whole box, box of cabbage if they wanna make sauerkraut. And we'll do a few contract orders for people that are regular customers that enjoy doing kimchi or a sauerkraut, or if they wanna preserve a bunch of corn. So if they wanna freeze their own corn, but they don't have space to grow it, we can grow an extra 100 years of corn for them and they can have a winter supply of corn. So between CSAs, farmer's market, direct sale selling through the website and just letting people know in a blurb, that pretty much gets rid of most of our vegetables. Okay, great. So. Thanks, Leon, that, that's a good overview. Um, Gil asks, what about soil compaction from running cattle on your growing beds during the winter? And in particular, uh, could you address um, how well your beds are make it through that? that whole operation of cattle on them and over the winter. With the raised beds, I found that, for instance, in the video, I showed some beds being made. If the beds have been established for a year and have settled and frozen and thawed, the cattle rarely disturb them that much. The beds just sink, go through their own soil atrophy a little bit. With fresh beds, I'm really trying to wait till the ground freezes before I put the cattle out there. So if I have just an electric fence going across that pen and I get one of the thawing days that we, we have right now or that we sometimes get in January, I can feed them in a, another round bale feeder where I can collect the compost and use that and fence them off out of that field. So if, by having two different areas, I can regulate where the cattle are gonna stand, what they're gonna compact. So by just monitoring how thawed my soil is or how old the beds are as far as if they've been established and it's a second or third year and I'm just moving the round bale feeder over it, the cattle don't seem to do that much for compaction. And with the freezing and thawing through the winter, I hardly notice it and I only till up a small area where I'm gonna plant anyway. Great. Um... Silas from New York asks, here in New York state, the ground doesn't always freeze. What is the effect of overweening cattle on unfrozen ground? You've kind of just answered that, but maybe you could put yourself in, in Silas's position, Leon, and any advice you might give us. Well, the first thing I would do, Silas, is if you have access to smaller cattle, there's gonna be less compaction. But 
the only way that I've figured out to do some of the things that I've done is to try a small area, do a trial, compare some of the areas where the cattle were compared to they, where they were not, and see if you can notice the difference. Or if just the idea of the sheet compost and holding the moisture helps keep the soil looser. So I don't have a definitive answer for you. I can say just try smaller spots and see, try smaller cattle if you can. And the less you soften your soil with tilling, the more resilience it's gonna have to compaction. Yeah. How about sheep and sheep and sheet composting, Lena? You know, have you tried that? I have not tried that as much. I mean, usually my sheep go into areas where I want them to mow it completely clean. And so with them taking off all the surface top, surface area, it's easier for me to go back in and just mark a couple of rows and pick out a crop I want to go into a more barren soil. Like where I sheet compost with cattle, I don't want to have to go back and scrape back that sheet compost to plant carrots. Or I don't want that sheet compost on top if I go through to burn the weeds and have all of my sheet compost and mulch catch on fire. So if I can incorporate where the sheep are and have them graze it to the soil, then I'm much more apt to come back in with a smaller plant, like an onion transplant or a carrot or beet, something that starts from a small seed. And if I can keep the sheet composting with the cattle where the sheets are quite a bit deeper, then I can go in and plant a larger transplant like a brassica or even a faster growing plant like a corn. Right. Okay. So gearing the sheet composting to the crop you want to put or the grazing, it just comes with experience. But you can figure out small seeds aren't going to get through as much mulch. Mm -hmm. Uh, Susan asks, if you don't till, how do you terminate your cover crop? Tarps or animals or both? It's usually almost animals, you know, and I do some tilling. I just try and minimize it. If I run into an area where I've had pigs and they missed a chunk of quack grass or a patch of Canadian thistles, I'm not opposed to going back in with a quacker and really ripping that up a couple of times just to throw some disturbance into that one small area. I just don't want to do it over the whole field. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, going back, Leon, to your pig tractor, uh, Gil asks, is this like a chicken tractor? It's just like a chicken tractor, except for the spelling. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, uh, so you have to move it uh, anywhere, probably usually every day then, is it's that right? It's usually better if you move it every day. I mean, if you run into a really thick spot of quack grass, maybe where you wash some vegetables or you had an irrigation leak in one of your main lines and the quack grass has been really established, you can let them there for a couple of days. But even more, I would recommend moving them off of that possibly coming in with a spring tooth or something else to loosen that soil a little bit mechanically and then move the pigs back to it and they can go through and clean it back out. So if Leon, you can help them, much, they can help you. How much um, quack grass survives this, this regimen that you have? You know, it depends kind of how thick the stand was, how many pigs that were there for how long. I would say if I can get an 80% to 90% reduction in quack grass from year to year, that's a pretty high standard. So they do a really good job as long as they're forced to do it in small areas and then brought back into it as it sprouts up again. So even the quack grass, though we see it as this like terrible weed, and it is, it was introduced here in the 20s for like irrigation bank stabilization. So when people were digging irrigation ditches, they were using quack grass to stabilize the soil. Hmm. So it's an introduced species. It's mostly a hybrid. Right. Yeah, I know what, from our grazing experience, quack grass is, is something that we, <laughs> we hate to see come in. And it's also, it's really hard to graze it out with sheep or cattle. 
Um, it it's is almost it's really tough awesome. to raise out. Yeah. But that's why I was so interested in with your what you're doing with your pigs, because you're having a lot more success um, than we ever could with sheep. Um, well, it's because, you know, the sheep are just taken off your surface and right. it's a rhizomatic grass. And so the pigs can go in and disturb the roots. And that seems to set it back far more. Right. One of the biggest problems I have is if I still have quack grass at the edge of the field, and I'm not cautious if I go in there with a spring tooth, then I drag it right back out over the field. And then I have to go back through and either hand pull some areas or turn it back into a pig shock system in, within a couple of years. Right, right. You do mention in the video a couple of times about using pigs to shock the system too. It's, I mean, they're disruptive to the soil. And so they completely go against my minimum tillage that I want to drive to. But by the same token, if I'm going to go in and shock my system or till the soil, I may as well be getting meat and benefit out of it instead uh -huh. of just using diesel fuel. Right. So right. my goal is to be a lazy farmer someday. <laughs> uh, Susan asks again, more specifically, if you don't till, how do you terminate your cover? Usually it's with grazing. I, I select my cover crops somewhat specifically, and I do till occasionally. If the pigs do not do a good enough job with getting stuff out, or if I'm going to come back in and plant an alfalfa crop. So I've been doing some communicating with the Western Montana Ag Research Station, and they're doing work on mallow. And their best results right now have been turning where they have mallow problems into a two-year rotation of alfalfa. So if I have alfalfa in an area, not even the pigs can dig out those five to six to 15 foot roots in some cases. Alfalfa is a really deep rooted plant. So I will have to go back in there and hit it with a spring tooth, possibly disc it and put enough stress on that plant to where it can reduce the numbers. I do not, I don't mold board plow, so I'm not gonna completely eliminate alfalfa. But if I have one or two spots of alfalfa in a quarter acre of a carrot field, it's not the end of the world. And if it provides a habitat for a bee or another pollinating insect, or just a benefit for something else in the ecosystem, I'm not losing that much in the value of carrots off of two or three plants in a quarter acre. Right, right. Um, Stan asks, Leon, when do you terminate your cover? You know, usually it's done in the fall. It depends on the cover crop. With, by picking, for instance, one of my favorite cover crops is probably sweet clover because it's a biennial. So I've got deep tap roots. I've got deep nutrient retrieval. If I have a hard pan in some of the areas where I farmed, I've had a hard pan. It helps to release it, helps bring some of the trace minerals up. But since it's a biennial instead of a perennial like alfalfa, if I keep it mowed or if I graze it off before it causes a bloating problem for my livestock, then I can pretty effectively have most of it done. Come back in with a spring tooth, maybe with the duck feet on it to cut some of the tap roots and maybe disc it lightly after that. And then I, that's one of those things where I feel like I've disturbed the soil enough to where I want to go in make beds and possibly sheet compost it with cattle or heavily compost it the next year and plant back into established beds. So if I'm gonna till an area, and I do sometimes, I wanna take care of that soil and build it back up for two or three years before I can before I need to till it again. Uh -huh. Great, great. <clears throat> um, let's see. See, we don't have any more questions in the chat box coming in. Does, would anybody like to ask a question uh, orally for, for Leon? He, um, I'm sure he'd be glad to answer anything and, and it, it doesn't have to be on the two subjects that we have, have focused on. Um, any question would be great. You know, maybe a certain uh, problem that you'd like to have addressed on, on your uh, specialty crop farm that you're kind of scratching your head on. Uh, maybe Leon can, 
can uh, provide some some advice on that, or maybe someone else in the crowd can provide some advice on that. We'd like to open the discussion up, please. Nobody has problems. Boy, I wish I had. Okay, there we got. Yeah, some. I, I got one for you, Leon. I'm, uh, I'm out here trying to do some no tilling in uh, Virginia. And the one animal I'm allowed to use is chickens. And uh, I haven't heard you talk about chickens. Is there any uh, advice or, uh, you know, just experience out there with, uh, with chickens? Animals? Yeah. Um. With SEMA spore going out of business and NOLO bait being the only grasshopper control that's basically left commercially, chickens are phenomenal for getting rid of grasshoppers. Oh. So that's the best use of chickens that I've found other than eating them and getting the eggs. They're <laughs> not really great for tillage, but they do provide a really strong nitrogen base for your compost. And so if you're not raising worms or making verma castings and you have chickens use them to your asset i don't have i have experience we have chickens but it's really tough to let them run in the fields and still maintain a semblance with fsma guidelines and so unless you're going to use a chicken tractor or like deer fencing or netting to keep them in an area i can't say that i've really used them as effectively as I probably could. So you could probably give me advice on it. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll, I'll report back, but we're using a lot of like tarps and, uh, you know, tarping for the winter out here. And then I just, my plan is to kind of open the tarps up and, you know, use your little uh, idea of just making little burrows and putting transplants in there or planting some like turnips and radishes, you know, small seeded. I think that's an excellent idea and it's a great way to approach it. I'm actually trying to, and I've used tarps and I've used weed cover and I'm really, our recycling place in our Valley has closed down because they couldn't make enough money. Mm -hmm. So there are furniture stores out there with truckloads of cardboard. So we've taken cardboard, laid it out in areas, watered it down, even using like T posts to keep it, the wind from blowing it away. We'll cut holes in it, just a small hole, and put strawberry transplants in it. So I'm trying to incorporate that cardboard back into my soil. It seems to be lasting for two to three years before I get too much of a weed load. And if that's the case, then as long as I'm pulling all the tape off of it and just using a straight brown cardboard, not something that's glossy, I don't feel as bad about putting it back into my soil. And if I needed to take a single disc blade, to like cut it after it had softened up from the rain and you just had like a coulter display or some way of slicing it, you could put your seeds right in that crack and they'll find the light. So that's, that's all I got for that. All right, well, thank you, Leon, I appreciate it. <clears throat> well, great discussion. Any other uh, questions out there or comments, things that have worked for for you, I know we have a very diverse audience uh, geographically tonight. So it looks uh, like Paul has a Paul question. Paul has a question. Yes. So I, I, I'm in, in um, northern Minnesota, um, and we generally have snow on the ground from about now until March. I've been doing the um, sheet composting with the cattle, but um, it seems that when, when I'm putting it down on top of snow, the, the, um, the layer of, of uh, manure and, and hay that's left behind is pretty darn thick um, to the point where it's really tough to get through it. I've been, I've been trying to plant corn there and I thought, oh great, just make, make, a, make a trench. But, but some of the areas that it was so thick that the, the corn couldn't really get established. So the areas I thought were gonna be the best because they had lots of manure and hay on them actually ended up growing the worst. I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that. Probably because the soil was so cold. And so the only thing I can suggest with that is if you can move your sheet composting a little more frequently. So if you're feeding round bales and you're doing a round bale feeder like I do, 
if you can use smaller bales or peel the outside layer or two off and hand feed those and put a smaller amount out there so that when it is taken apart, you have a thinner layer. Because with the sheet composting, and I'm originally from Iowa and I know that ground freezes really deep. So if there's a thinner layer on, it's going to thaw out faster. But with corn in particular, it really needs that warm soil in order to germinate. So one of the tips or tricks that I've learned is I plant small amounts of corn, it's sweet corn. So if I pre-soak my corn seeds, I also take like a small rinse of grapefruit seed extract to help rinse the seeds before I plant them. That helps some of the resistance of the molds that attack the corn and cold soil. So it's my own type of way of not cap tanning it, but just using an organic grapefruit seed extract in a thin rinse seems to give me a better germination. So I tried looking for some different research on it and I knew people were using different essential oils, be they mints or rosemaries. And when it came to the point where they wanted me to pay to get the results, I said, screw it, I'm just gonna do my own trials. So I just started wet socking things and did it in Ziploc bags. And I tried a bunch of different essential oils. The grapefruit seed, seed extract seemed to work the best. And it was better than my control of just water. So that's for planting wet seed that's already soaked up. But I know I'm planting corn into like right at 49 to 50 degree temperatures too. And so that gets a little bit tougher. So with that sheet composting method that I suggested, maybe a week before you plant it, if you could go through with like a duck foot and peel that sheet compost back a little bit, or even disc blades set in culture fashion to spread it out to warm up your soil a little bit. You're still gonna get some weed growth where you work the soil, but you're still gonna get a lot of moisture retention in the rest of it. So those would be a couple of things I try. Once again, do it in small amounts. Don't hunt me down later. <laughs> yeah. um, we've got a question from Silas. Um, does integrating animals replace compost application? It's, it's more of a mix. So there's some areas where I'm gonna grow stuff like corn or squash and heavier feeders. So I want to at least apply compost into the root zone. So I can do that on the back of a manure spreader by putting gates or pieces of plywood attached from chain to get it into the areas where I wanna plant the planting zone. I try not to broadcast any more compost than I need to. If I can work on building up the soil, then I can utilize that compost in other areas, be it the pastures, be some compost for sale. So if I can incorporate my compost into my root zone area, then I'm maximizing my nutrient efficiency. It's just what the commercial farmers do when they're dropping synthetic fertilizer as they're planting. Leon, can you explain that, that uh, setup that you have on your manure spreader again? I didn't quite understand that. So I welded a couple of chain links or a few links of chain to the back of my manure spreader. I can take a piece of plywood on a reinforced piece of uh, angle iron, and I can guide where my manure output is coming out of the back. Not 100%, but I can major put the majority of it in. If I run my apron speed a little bit lower, if I'm only doing like a half of a bed or I'm doing two center rows, different manure spreaders are gonna work different with it. You may have to add a bottle and angle iron just so you have something to attach to, but where there's a will, there's relatives. So <laughs> if you can possibly put your compost or your even your trace minerals, if you're going to add that, or mycorrhizal fungi in the zones where they're going to be used, I strongly suggest taking the time to figure out how to do that. And if you're going to do it in still minimum till, just think, think about putting like a cultivator sweep in and not running it as deep, but guiding your compost or manure into your root zone. 
So you're still disturbing the very top inch or so of the soil, but you're pushing your nutrients out into the zone where your roots can use it. So am I right then, Leanne, in getting this through my head right? You're um, <clears throat> pretty much planting plants, whatever species they are every year in the same row. So your, your soil that is developed is being the same soil that's grown every year in your row crop. Is that right? Or yes not? and no. I mean, to a certain extent, it's in the same raised bed. Mm -hmm. But if I figure that my rows are either 12 inches apart or 18 inches apart, or it's just one row going down the center, I can vary if I want to put beets and carrots, which are three rows per bed, or if I want to put brassicas, which may be two rows a bed, or if I want to put squash, which is just one row down the center of the bed. So I'm using slightly different areas because though the microbes are going to migrate, and the nutrients are going to migrate, they're not taking a greyhound. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to put them, if I can mix up the different crops that I have in those zones, I'm essentially planting the seed into a different chunk of soil each year. I see. Uh -huh. So Great. three rows, two rows, one row, and then just rotating back and forth between that. And then after I get about three or four years into it, it's time for me to usually bring pigs back in or go back in, retill it, reshape the beds. If I dig up potatoes, I'm tilling the soil. If I dig up the carrots, I'm tilling the soil to get them out because my soil is not loose enough for me to pull carrots out by their tops. <laughs> so it's regretful, but it's just not the case. So I still have to fork them out or dig them. And then if I have to work a soil like that, then I'm gonna gear towards putting a smaller seed into it the next year because I've already worked up that soil. So it's going to be easy to reshape that bed and plant a, a more fragile seed into it the following year. Right. Okay. Stan, did, did you have a question? I saw your hand shoot up and then we kept talking. Actually more of a comment um, on the, uh, I live on the east side of the Rocky Mountains in, in Montana, close to Leon, but it gets very cold over here and ground freezes really fast. And uh, two things that I've done in, I don't have a market garden, I have my own garden. So I'm stealing some ideas here. But uh, I've used chickens in the past as a weed control. You just can't cover as big an area as you can with pigs. And I put down a pretty thick base covering of hay in their pen or straw, and that helps to control the weeds. And then you have to rake it aside because the ground stays too cold here unless I get it on before it freezes. If I get it on before it freezes, then it keeps the ground warm through the winter. Um, one of the things I've seen one of our cattle guys do, and um, he had really good, I'm also an agronomist that works with a lot of different farmers in the area. So one of my cattle guys rolls the hay bales out and uses that to develop his sheet mulch instead of bulking it. So he gets a thinner cover of mulch, it's easier to plant through the next year. Um, instead of having a big thicker one, like Leon's pictures seem to be pretty deep. So there's just two thoughts I had that, from the other and guys' questions. Speaking to Stan, I do have a field that's on a hillside and I have put round bale feeders out there or round bales out there. And as they rolled down the hill, I did get that sheet compost effect, but it was so deep at the bottom because the hill was too steep and the bale rolled right down the fence almost every time. Then I started moving to round bale feeders. And so there's a couple of different sizes of bales out there and you can even use square bales in round bale feeders. They're not shaped definite. So if you have the large square bales and you don't want to put it on a stick, you can just take your loader bucket or skid steer wrap a chain around half of the bale after you've got the strings and put that in your round bale feeder. So you can adjust the level of how thick your sheet compost is gonna be by how much you feed them and how often you use the round bale feeder. Okay. But I did like the idea of the chickens with the base layer of hay down because that's really trapping a bunch of the nitrogen from the chicken manure as well. And it's also gonna be something to help with that microbial activity in the top inch of your soil. 
Great. Any more comments or, or questions? Sure. Well, seeing none, I think what we'll do next is we'll have a real short poll. And then if you could please just answer the questions, there's only four or five. And uh, they are very helpful to us in, in improving our, our outreach to, to everybody. And then we're gonna stay on after that poll. And uh, if anybody has any questions for uh, Devin or, and Tristan on their research, any questions that you didn't get a chance to ask a few weeks ago when we did the webinar, we will turn it over to them. So first for the polling. We'll give them 15 more seconds and then we'll end, Dave. Okay. Okay. Okay, we really thank you for, for answering those questions for us. It's very helpful. And now we'd like to move on to uh, uh, Devin Reagan and Tristan Benson's part of the the little session. And uh, first of all, I want to just give them a chance to uh, say what was, for each one of them, what was the one of the more outstanding things that they learned from their research? Maybe, maybe even something that was a little bit of a surprise. And we'll start with you, Devin, if you would, please. Thanks, Dave. One of the coolest things I thought about our research was that, well, we found out that we can finish lambs on a field and have that carcass be comparable or even better to a lamb finished in a, in a feedlot. And so when we were actually doing this trial over the last three years, the lambs in the field were running around and appeared to be exercising more than lambs that were in a confinement pen. But at the end of the trial, we saw that they actually had um, bigger ribeyes and uh, had a larger ending body weight. And so we must have figured out something that was that was going right in those fields. And, you know, we can't really measure happiness when you when you do a study. I think it would be really interesting to uh, do another a uh, sister study to this and maybe measure cortisol or stress levels in sheep and compare animals out on the field compared to animals in confinement. And I suspect that out on a the field, they're probably less stressed and maybe that gives them a higher growth potential. But I think that was one of the most interesting things that I learned from our research. Yeah, yeah you know, just as being a sheep, sheep producer, uh, I've taken that little thing from Devin and uh, we've noticed that when we 
feed our lambs. We finish lambs over the winter for direct market. Um, we've noticed that when we uh, just give them a whole bunch of feed once a day versus going out there uh, and giving them, feeding them once a day, but then pushing it up in a flat manger five times a day, they run and jump, you know? So it, it really made me think, aha, this is what Devin was telling us. You know, uh, the more you can create a stimuli, uh, a stimulus for animals, the more they are happy. And, and I think Devin has kind of showed us that happiness does, does turn into um, more gain, maybe better tasting meat, who knows? There's a lot of factors out there that we really don't know of scientifically, but we kind of, it kind of makes sense intuitively. And so I, I actually, thank you for that. Devin. Oh, sorry, Dave. I, I actually read a study that uh, was conducted in China where they were feeding animals or sheep in confinement. They were finishing lambs in confinement and they had two separate treatment groups. One group, all they did was put a platform in the middle of their pen, just something for them to jump on and stand on. The other pen had no enrichment activity and the lambs in the pen that had that platform finished better, higher average daily gain, higher ending body weights than lambs in the pen without any kind of toy. So I thought that was kind of a cool study. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot to it that, that you know, we may not know about now or even give enough attention to um, that really does make a difference. Um, does anybody have any questions for Devin and her project, you know, on Feedlot on Fields project? Um, if you had a chance to look at that webinar, if you would have any more questions, and if you didn't have a chance to look at the webinar, I would really urge you to go to the Atra site and download that webinar. It's really interesting, uh, both she and Treston's research, what it, what it came up there. So any questions for Devin? Let's see, we got one here uh, from Gil, who says, I have also been mostly pasture raising lambs. One key seems to be having lambs born earlier in the winter so that they can get the best of the spring go growing season here in Iowa. I have been feeding about 5% of their diet in concentrates, mostly for inspection and in moving purposes. A local producer here said that the chefs much preferred the grass-based lambs over feedlot lambs. That's a great point, Gil. I totally agree with you. Um, and I think also what some work that uh, Dr. Fred Provenza, uh, an emeritus of Utah State University has done a lot on, on feeding uh, lambs a diverse ration versus like a TMR of of alpha, alpha hay and barley or corn, just three or four ingredients. The more diverse uh, ingredients and feedstuffs you have in that ration, the better tasting the lamb's gonna be. So it's a whole new uh, area of, of uh, research that I think is really exciting on it. So great comment, Gil, thank you for that. Anybody else? Well, Tristan, we'll, we'll move on to you then. What's, what's the one thing that kind of stood out to you in your research with Devin? Yeah, so speaking more on the soil side of things, um, my study is kind of looking specifically at soil microbes and changes in diversity. And one thing that we found that was really interesting as um, within all the three farms that we've been cooperating with, we saw more diversity in the microbe systems in the soil after we put sheep out on all these fields versus beforehand, which I thought was pretty interesting. So we don't have all the data for the last two years, but that was kind of the first preliminary data that we had when we started the study. Great, great. Any questions for Tristan or comments? If, if no one has a question about that, I'd kind of like to jump back to uh, what Stan was talking about with the, his chickens in his own personal garden. 
I did a little bit in my personal garden with my chickens this year. It was a bad grasshopper year and boy, my mint was just decimated by grasshoppers. And uh, I mean, I have 10 personal chickens, so not a huge garden, but letting the chickens out uh, just, you know, it, you kind of got to watch what crop you let them out, but they would not eat the mint, but they did go through and pick off all of those grasshoppers that were destroying it. So that was pretty helpful for me. I actually did a little chicken grazing rotation this year with my 10 chickens and I set up electric fence that came right off of their coop just in our pasture to help eliminate some of those grasshoppers. And I did see a difference just by doing that. You know, on a side note too, when, when our kids were, were pretty young, maybe six to eight years of age, um, we had chickens too, and and uh, it it kept our kids just occupied all day, picking up their chicken and just going around the garden, and the house, watching them eat the grasshoppers, just zippo. <laughs> so it was a great activity to keep kids happy. A lot better than the cell phone. Maybe my chickens can uh, be my babysitter next summer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. Well, if there's no more questions or comments or anything, we really want to thank you guys for coming and, and contributing and taking part in this. And really a big special uh, thank you to Leon. Uh, if you haven't watched his video yet, I really urge you to do so. Uh, he's just got a wealth of information there. And we thank Leon so much for, for shooting that video for us and for being here tonight. Um, kudos to you, Leon, and we thanks very much. Um, also, Devin and Tristan, thank you for your time tonight for showing up. I guess we got a raised hand from Paul. That's just a clapping hand. Oh. <laughs> thank you, Paul. <laughs> Is that okay, a one-handed clap? You, <laughs> thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, yeah. Leon. You bet. Anytime. Thanks, gang. Okay. Well,